Hi, and welcome to this conversation about better materials and how they might contribute to a better planet. I am Andy, I'm one of Bellroy's co-founders and our CEO, but more importantly today I'm joined by Dr. Luke Haverholz, who is founder and CEO of Natural Fibre Welding, um, one of the most innovative materials companies on the planet. But Luke himself is a chemist and material scientist, but also a deep thinker, a business leader, and someone that's genuinely working towards a better future for all of us. Um, welcome, Luke. Hey, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Oh, so good to have you. Um, Belroy and NFW, Natural Fibre Welding, started almost two years ago, a relationship where we got to start to explore your technologies and try and wrap our head around how significant they were, the differences with them, the sort of potential in the platform. Um, but I guess one of the big motivations, there's a motivation for us around what we can do from a performance level, but obviously sustainability, working on a better earth, ecology, um, even chemistry is a major motivator mm -hmm. for, I think, both of us. Mm -hmm. For you guys, the way you see the problems in the world, the way you see the opportunity to perhaps improve the Earth's ecology. I'd love to just start with you laying that context. Like, how do you see the world and the challenges that you've helped set up NFW to maybe address or tackle? Yeah, I think maybe the, the most succinct way to say it, and we'll talk about it, you know, today is it, you think about everything, both, you know, us as individuals, but our clothes, our shoes, our bags, the things that we have around us, they all have where it comes from stories and where it is going to or where it will end up sort of uh, aspects to the story. So uh, the way the way I thought as a chemist, the way natural fiber welding is, is set up to, to think about and, and how we solve problems is really holistic, holistic about making sure that where things come from is is well thought out where there's not never ending cascades of interventions around you know if you do something wrong over here now you got to intervene over there which means you're intervening so avoiding those sort of scenarios and then at the exact same time in parallel where is it going to when we met met you and and the bellroy story is you know you're making these these products that are meant to last well, as long as possible. And, and that, that's one of the key things. There's so many people in this world who, anyway, you, you make this thing that doesn't last very long or it's not well made, it, it's, it's made for a trend. And now all of a sudden you gotta replace it. Well, when you make high quality things that do what they're supposed to do um, and they last a long time, that's, that's a, the, the best where it goes to story is you never have to part ways with it. Okay, and then there's the, the realities of everything has a, has a lifetime. So. Um, yeah, maybe most succinctly the way I can say it again is we think holistically about where materials come from. We think holistically about in the form of products, where those materials are going to go to and how do we partner with and work with, with people like you, Andy, and, and the Bellroy team on making products, um, that have an integrated holistic sort of answer to all those, those types of questions. I love it. Um, so the major two platforms you have are the Mirim platform and the Claris platform. Um, can you talk about what each of those are and, and the way they're trying to address that, that contextual sort of yep. opportunity that you've outlined? First of all, I'll say, you know, Claris and Mirim, these are made up words because they really represent uh, ingredient brands. So our, you know, natural fiber welding, doesn't exist to disrupt what Bellroy's of the world do. We, we exist to partner with and help create new kinds of products that you couldn't make certain ways before. And where again, they have the, the right where it comes from, where it goes to story. So the Claris is the platform for how we think about textiles. So, you know, there's textiles, of course, that we wear, that are in shoes, that are in bags, headliners of cars, Claris is the platform of where NFW, you know, textiles is a discipline and a, and a 
material set in this world in its own right, right? Okay, Miram is the ingredient brand uh, that stands for all the value propositions and things that you have to do well when you're working with leather-like materials. So we'll just note, you know, there's already leather in this world. There's already synthetic, uh, you know, some would call them vegan. We can talk more about that later, but whether they're vegan or not, but anyway, they're synthetic leathers. Um, Miram is a platform that goes and it's, it's really um, designed to, to be able to, again, address those things where you need a leather like material. I'll, I'll say that underneath all of that, there's actually nine different technology families that work together to make this kind of thing possible. So um, whereas there are some particular things technology wise that underpin Claris and underpin Miram, there's actually deep technology connections between those, those platforms as well and how we can actually take things that we can do sometimes that's most mostly just for the Claris line, but we can actually bring that in and make Miram better. And there's things that we can do with Miram that with the underlying technologies that make Claris better. And then I'll say, and then there's, there's new things coming. Like here's, here's a foam material, right? That, that is neither leather nor a textile, but it's a foam and it's all natural. And it has the kind of where it comes from and where it goes to story that you would want to, you'd want to tell. And there's this, here's a shoe sole uh, that has a, where it comes from and where it goes to story that everyone wants to tell. So there, there's a broad ecosystem of materials that are possible. And then those ecosystem, those individual um, species within the ecosystem, two of them we have names for, Claris, <laughs> Miram. There's a lot more of the ecosystem to come in the near future. That's pretty exciting. And you do have some samples there. So uh, I'd say mm -hmm. a t-shirt behind you, some of the things yeah. that, so this is fiber welding. Yeah. So, so, you know, the name of the company is natural fiber welding. And that comes from back when I was, uh, uh, working at the United States Naval Academy, uh, with people like Paul Trulove and Dave Durkin, Hugh DeLong. Um, anyway, we were working on how do you make new things from biomaterial and biomass in general and new ways to like, and, and you know, back in those days, we didn't have um, t-shirts necessarily in mind or any one application. We we're just like chemists trying to figure out what do the laws of the universe allow you, uh, humans to do with all natural materials. And so one of the things we discovered is that you can, you can take fiber um, and make it, basically weld or fuse itself together, natural fibers. So um, not just cotton, not just hemp, but wool and silk and all the natural fibers that are out there. You know, nature has lots of different things. It builds with proteins, sugars, etc. cetera. So um, this t-shirt is special for, for a few reasons. Um, what, th this t-shirt happens to be cotton, but in this case, the, the cotton is 100% recycled. So today people, you know, when we grow cotton crop, cotton typically when it gets used in a t-shirt, when the t-shirt reaches the end of its life, that's it. It gets thrown away or burned or, or wherever t-shirts, wherever you put t-shirts. Um, the reason why t-shirts aren't recycled has to do with the length of the fiber that, so if you take an old t-shirt and you kind of break it apart, you uh, you tear down the material, you tear down the 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 fi fiber length, and so what we discovered at the Naval Academy days, and then what natural fiber welding. When I started the company, one of the core things I knew was a a good idea to commercialize was this idea that if you can get fibers to fuse, then there are particular problems within making textiles where you can make textiles more durable. You can make textiles um, that wick moisture more effectively that are more breathable. And today we do many of these things, many of the performance fabrics that we use in the world um, come from plastic because plastic can be molded and extruded into certain kinds of shapes and things like that. But we had invented um, a way to, to, to open up those possibilities to the natural world. So again, 
natural world being not only natural, but in this case, an old t-shirt turning into a new t-shirt where the new t-shirt has better performance and qualities and attributes as it in its second life than it had in its first life. So that's, that's some of the things that we're doing with Claris. Absolutely. And the way you use natural is a little different. So, so with many brands or, um, marketing terms, we hear natural discussions in the processing of those things though, there's often perhaps unnatural ingredients, synthetic ways, petrochemical, hydrochemical, activations, catalysts, things like that. Can you talk a little bit about, um, earlier on, you talked about those interventions that can go deep and yep. one intervention here triggers another and another. Can you talk a little bit about your semi-puritanical stance on um, yeah. the sorts of ingredients you want to work with? That's right. So when, when we say we work with natural materials, uh, one of the core insights is that, uh, you know, think about your kitchen. So your kitchen has flour, eggs, sugar, water, milk, etc., and from and, and maybe a cabinet with a bunch of special spices and, and things like that. But with that standard sort of pantry of inputs, you can make souffle and pancakes and birthday cake and graham crackers and all these very different kinds of things. Um, and, you know, depending on, on what the recipe is, depending on how you mix and treat the materials, uh, then you can make these different things. And I guess we, we take it all for granted that in our kitchens, when we, when we start making, you know, like bread from, from our pantry, we don't take those ingredients and put them in some chemical digester and digest them down to, to like some sort of soup typically, and then put it in another kind of a reactor that builds it back up into some sort of precursor to polymer and then turn it into it, and, and then mix it with plasticizers and do all these things. We, we, we just, we take the natural ingredients as they are and we carefully select those things. And I don't know, we might grind the, the, you know, the fiber finer or sorry, the, the flour finer or something like that. But we, we, we all have this intuition, intuition around how we bake, right. And, and how we cook. And I'll say that's, that's what NFW is. So when, when you think about where plastics come from, plastics come from this, um, amazingly complex and expensive, by the way, system where we, we dig up this material, fossil materials from the ground, and then we put those materials through a whole bunch of different kinds of separating technologies and digesting and cracking and fr all these different kinds of technologies that are designed to build uniform chemical, little chemical molecules and things that then get combined and put together and catalyzed and heated and to, to make then regular things, but regular polymers, let's say. And then those polymers get compounded with plasticizer and other things so that those things can take on, well, you know, if I go back to all, think about all these oil rigs, all these pump jacks, all these pipelines, all these refineries, all of the factories that take the Gen 1, Gen 2 petrochemicals out of refineries, make polymers, then polymers get laid up. And okay, all of that stuff in, to make a leather like synthetic material. When one of the core insights again, is that what if you could just take cork? What if you could take other ground up lignocellulose? What if you could take waste cotton? What if you could take industrial hemp? What if you could take vegetable oils and natural rubber and things like that and combine those materials? directly as they are in the same way that when you bake bread, you don't break the flour down into anything else. You just use the flour as you, as it was ground up from the field, put those things together, build a, a contiguous sort of set of baking techniques. So when I said earlier, we have like nine different kind of like technologies. Think of the technologies as, as fancy industrial baking techniques of various sorts. Um, and, and now Again, just like, you know, there's, there's some techniques you use to make souffle and different techniques to make your multi-layer birthday cake. Well, here you go. Here's, here's the output. There was no pump jacks and oil rigs and fleets of ships and all these other things. It's just like this, you can make this stuff from the field. Okay, you got to know what you're doing from a chemistry perspective. And there's, 
devils and details to take care of. But that's basically the core essence. We don't break things down. So therefore, we don't have to pay the expense to break things down. And then we also don't, therefore, don't have to build things back up. One of the things that people don't recognize is, you know, when a tree grows, when you're looking at a tree, you're not only looking at an amazing, you know, beautiful thing, but from a chemistry perspective, from a manufacturing perspective, the, the way in which those materials, the, the, you know, the cellulose and the hemicellulose and the lignin, the way those materials are arranged are wonderfully complex. And if you're going to break that down, not only is it going to cost you money, you're going to destroy all of that amazing order and structure that the natural thing had. So we, we, we take it for granted that we can get these things at unbelievably low cost and from sunlight and, and soil. Um, okay. If you can cook with those things directly, then that's, that's the, not just the low cost way to it. go. It ends up being the higher performance. So one of the things that blew my mind when I first started to sort of dive in and understand the platforms you're building, um, Cradle to Cradle was a hugely influential text for me, you know, in, um, when it was released. And in that, they outline this idea of two major material yeah. streams that we can build products from. One is biological nutrients, which are things like all the plant matter. They can go back into the earth, be decomposed, broken down in these natural cycles and then rebuild again. And the other being the technical nutrient stream, which is the petrochemical um, side of things. It's a lot of synthetics mm -hmm. where the goal, instead of breaking them down, is to recycle them, hopefully endlessly. But in every recycling, you might have a little breakdown, a little um, yep. sort of loss of the integrity or more pollutants, more things coming into it. And in that, it, it, it was this really clarifying yeah. thing of like, choose your stream, commit to it. You know, at end of life, do you decompose it? Or at end of life, do you take it and recycle it, trying to maintain as much integrity as you can? And then as I started to come into that, the, the mirrors, the, the family of leather-like materials you're holding up, they're a bit different in that, um, in those two chains, the major issue has always been the consumer, unfortunately. What happens for us is we take something and we might not separate it quite right into our recycling bin. And so maybe some of that has to be thrown away because there's too many pollutants. Or we might co-mingle things and they're hard to separate. Or we might throw them in landfill rather than a genuine sort of commercial composting that can break it down properly. You guys seem to mix those two streams. Like what what we seem to have is a material that because it's all natural, because of the things, it could move into a decom decomposition mode. It could be broken down into nutrients. Or you have some tricks to pull it apart and recycle it again. Can, can you talk about that and just like for me, that felt like a fundamental paradigm shift. Well, there's a couple ways to think about that. First, we'll just say, you know, let's, let's start with the actual the technical nutrient side of things. So there's there's a couple of things about recycling that plastic and technical nutrients that some people, you know, don't know about, which is two, two big issues. One is, you know, something complex like a shoe. So here's a shoe made with all natural um, ingredients, right? The, the NFW way. Um, but some typically your, your, your modern shoe is made with not just one kind of plastic. Typically it's, it's many, many different kinds of plastic. And then even if it is made with one kind of plastic, that plastic has to be formulated differently for the eyelets versus the shoelaces versus the, the foam that your foot is going to be comfy on versus the rubber or the, the harder outsole that has to have a skin to be, you know, abrasion resistant. Cause that's going to be rubbing up against the asphalt when you're walking in the city or something. So, um, part of the, the, the reason why plastics typically are not recycled is because most products are complex. Most products are mixtures. Um, so hold that in mind. And then we'll also say, even if you can, uh, recycle plastic, then people tend to forget that most plastic recycling is like break things back down to the soup and then only have to build it back. So the carbon footprint actually isn't that much 
better typically. Now there, there you know, there's some, there's some incremental improvements when you, when you have clear plastic pot bottles or, or soda bottles, then you can extrude that material into a textile fiber. And then you can, I guess you can call it recyclings. That's what people call it, but I'll say it's a one-way function right now into textiles, then that themselves are not recycled. So it, it's a second use. It's a second use of that technical nutrient, but it's not a anything one would consider to be a loop. So, um, and, and if you think about like solving that, where it comes from and where it can go to, the, the, the kinds of problems you need to solve in that technical cycle are, are very different kinds of problems. So that's where I say um, it, it, you end up with not just a no, but like a fractal no about what, like what you might do over here to make one kind of plastic more recyclable is going to wreck the day of the deconstruction recycle. You know, anyway, these things like compete with each other many times. So that's a thing to, to consider. Um, and then the, the insight, another insight you could say is, and, and then you look, let's go back to the tree. The tree is made up of many different kinds of materials and yet nature knows how to recycle it. So, okay, what, what we do, how, what I would say is we, we try to combine certain elements of the, te- of the technical nutrient cycle because um, one thing plastic does really amazingly well, which is you can, you can take different plastics, mold and shape those plastics into different things, combine those things together and make amazing <laughs> products. So, you know, as, as, as much as, um, you know, we, we can say, well, plastics aren't so great. They also do really wonderful things for us. Like plastics are both wonderful and terrible at the same time. The NFW approach is to say, okay, we want balance. And I would, I would say where people looked at the natural nu- nutrient cycle and where before they didn't look at that natural nutrient cycle and say, how can I make an entire shoe possible? Not just, not just, it's not good enough to just make a leather like material. It's it's not good enough um, to make a leather-like material in a foam only. It's not. You need you need the ecosystem of different materials, and if you can manufacture and really, what I'd say is, we are opening up the the possibilities for what you can do in the natural nutrient cycle. And then the the, the nice thing is, if you do that, you know there was no life didn't evolve and can't evolve fast enough to handle all the complexities of of being a key part of the recycling of the technical nutrient cycle. Moreover, driving that technical nutrient cycle, if you want to have 7.5 billion people on planet earth in that cycle, well, it's, we know the consequences of just a couple billion people using petrochemicals and the products of petrochemicals. So get, so the nice thing about the natural, the new natural cycle is, is, it's already very abundant. You know, there's more new plant matter that grows in your average day on planet earth than the combined tonnage of all the plastic stuff made by people in many years. And so there's plenty. So lots of people can enjoy. And then if you can open up the possibilities for what you can do in that cycle, then all of a sudden now footwear doesn't have to be locked into a technical format that's not actually very recycle or not not very circular and then even if it was circular it's spewing off stuff you can put it in the natural cycle and if you can do it all natural then just like a tree you trees can be ground up broadcast into fields they don't even trees don't have to be composted trees fall in forests the, the forest doesn't have to like figure out how to compost the tree the tree falls apart on different time frames it's totally fine you can look at products in a different way, right? And then that that gets you to this. Well, now that cycle, that new nut- the natural product cycle, if you will, doesn't have to kick out microfiber plastic pollution. Doesn't have to kick out plasticizers that um, the, the the molecules have shapes that kind of mimic the shapes of hormones in our body and start playing games with with uh, women who are pregnant and and young children and things like that. Like you can get away from all of that because you can deal with those nutrients that are endemic in our environment and around us every day and, and where life has grown up together for it to be in harmony and in balance in that way. That's, um, yeah, that's how we think about it. It's like, how do we get more possibility out of the, out of the natural nutrient cycle 
knowing that there's there's this one thing within the technical nutrient cycle that that humans have have been able to do amazingly well, which is to have an ecosystem of things that are moldable and shapeable into all of these things that make great products. The way I interpret it is this acknowledgement of the interconnectedness of life and of the different stakeholders on our planet. So, you know, at Bellroy, we, we, we like to think of people, animals, yeah, that's, and that's the planet. That's a great way to put it. That's a and great way to put it. How do we do things that... Um, build a sort of nurturing loop for all those three major stakeholders. So how um, so much of human activity that um, just to fully acknowledge it, there are parts to technology and the, the platform and the innovation that's happened over the last 100, 200 years that have been incredible for bringing humans out of extreme poverty, um, improving child mortality, improving so many health metrics, life metrics, that are incredible, but often it's been at the expense of the animals and the planet. As you talk, it, it, it talks of, yeah, it, it feels like this acknowledgement of the interconnectedness and that yep. when we find solutions, um, you know, large scale commercial agriculture has all sorts of issues when we start to monocrop and, and, and take these massive fields and try and eliminate everything yep. that doesn't feel controllable to grow one crop in one way. And once you do that, you know, you've got one pest could take over. So then you need these pesticides and then you're depleting the same nutrients out of the soils in every single cycle. So then you need these synthetic fertilizers to try and replace some of those. It, every time we try and really isolate and do only yeah. this one thing and try and eliminate all variables, we, we seem to get into all these intervention stacks and all these challenges. And to me, it feels like what you're saying is look for those natural ecosystems that have a balance. They, they, they already understand cycles and work with those in ways where you're not trying to isolate everything down to only this one thing you're going after, pretending you can eliminate all the other complexity. Yeah, well, well said. Uh, you know, think about industrial agriculture for, for a moment. Um, so you can go back 120 or something years, right? And well, you can even go back 60 years and there were no plastics. But I was going to say, go back 120 years. There were no petrochemicals really in plastics industry. There was, it was anyway, the nascent um, new place to get energy. And we could we could acknowledge something like, you know, um, the, the folks that were first getting uh, oil refineries we're making a product that was displacing the whale blubber industry, right? So we were hunting whales to, ex it, it, you know, to extinction at a certain point in time, just to light our homes. Okay. And then we got this. So you could argue that the petrochemical industry kind of has its roots in something that was the green chemistry of its day. It was better than hunting whales to extinction, right? Okay. But what happened was uh, people found, and there is this amazing efficiency of, um, of focus. So what happened is in the last, you know, 100, 120 years is that the production system that is the conventional production system that works for, you know, first world, quote unquote, or developed whatever world situations where you have people making stuff with a, what I would call the petrochemical refinery production system. And that system seeks uniformity Be because you, you want your stainless steel, uh, you know, various kinds of reactors and things to operate under certain kinds of standard conditions. And so chemists have been so focused on fitting everything into that production model, in including the fact that, oh, I can fit corn into that model. Well, I guess that just means we should only ever plug number two dent corn into this thing. And it's like, some of the the, 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 the the kind of like philosophy and approach of mass production and uniformity that works so well also works against us when we then try to apply it to everything, right? And so, um, you know, in the meantime, like, you know, as NFW thinks about materials like this, you have, uh, you know, nature is abundant, it's redundant, and it's diverse. And so 
just like people have developed different food culture on different continents and different parts of different continents, and yet you find well-nourished, you know, you find wonderful culture in, in every place where people live around food. Well, guess what? You can develop recipes that take advantage of the local, abundant, redundant, diverse of, of ingredients that are available. So this production model that I'm talking about, um, the, the other thing is it has its challenges because we don't seek uniformity in the same way. Of course, we, if, if Belroy is going to make uh, one of your fine wallets or bags, then, then you need this material to, form, to perform to certain uh, threshold you know, quality attributes and things like that. So you have to take care of that. That's non-trivial. But, but when you do take care of that and you can take care of it, you know, with different kinds of sawdust or different kinds of natural fibers, different kinds of oils. Now, now you can um, go to wh what's the ultimate system, which is a regenerative system, a system where nature knows better how to heal planet earth than, than really humans do. And, and w when we let, when we simply make sure that we fit in and we achieve balance within that ecosystem, not only can we live well, everything else around us gets better too. And, 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 you know, very fortunately for humans, the way I see the world as a chemist is there's a lot of things that we, we, we haven't done right where we've caused great harm and where it'll take a long time to heal all of that. And yet this planet has, and, and life and the diversity and the redundancy and the uh, an abundance of life has this amazing ability to heal much more than we could try to synthetically do it ourselves. So um, that's, that's a key thing. It's like, if you can figure out how to embrace that diversity. I mean, we can talk about that. That's not just true from a making Miriam perspective. We talk about how from a people perspective, from a society where you need different perspectives and, and different aspects to thing make the whole the sum of the parts better than than the individuals and it's it's about leverage and measurement when you talk to a chemist you're you're able to break the world into these different components and understand not only uh the the mix of components coming together but the processes that mix them and and when we try and do all of those in a very deliberate, legible way that feels like we can control it with big machines, we miss parts of it. And when we use natural cycles, it, it's so interesting you talking about just the plant matter generation on planet Earth. And you okay. know, if, if you look at the total amount of solar energy landing on the planet in any one day, it's more than all the forms of energy we use and consume in a year as as humankind. And so it's like there are these abundant things where instead of a scarce resource that yep. takes, you know, a million years to bring the energy density down into those fossil fuels that we burn in a split second, if we can learn to use solar, if we can learn to use these plant cycles, if we can learn to sort of tap into these, then this isn't just a sort of hippie dream about, you know, peace, love, mung beans and wouldn't a utopic future be beautiful if it was possible it can actually make commercial sense. Mm -hmm. can, like when I hear you talk about, you know, um, in other conversations, price to performance and those yeah. sorts of things that could feel a bit hard-nosed. But if this is actually going to reach scale, it's really important that we understand how to make it commercially viable. Can you talk a little bit about just how you see that price to performance and, and why you believe this can actually make a yeah. real impact? When NFW was started, one, one thing I already knew is true is that you can get, if you can use these, the, the question was, can you use these uh, ingredients to bake and create something that performs like this performs? But there was no question. The question was already solved for, will it be, will it come from materials that are low cost and abundant? So, you know, when you mentioned like the amount of solar energy that's available, well, plants are tapped into that. Like you, you could say the original circular economy is basically starts with a green plant, right? Or, yeah, okay, we could talk about, uh, you know, how bacteria, there's, there's other parts of the family tree, right? Um, but, but the point is, um, think about the amount of nutrients. So, you know, you, you can actually, you can put a cost to things like glucose has an energy value. So you can put a price to that. It has a 
caloric food value. You can put, okay. And there's so much of this stuff in this natural economy that's around us that we just kind of take for granted, right? But there's so much of that stuff that if it were put into the forms that anyway, feed us, that that clothe us, et cetera, there's way more than we need, way more. It's a matter of efficiently tapping into that original circular economy. Okay, so um, when the company was founded, I, I didn't worry about what is the price of some of these biomaterials going to be. I wasn't worried about uh, diversity. I wasn't worried that we were, that we were ever going to be overly dependent on one kind of crop or another. Because, as you well point out, I mean, we can say we have this problem in the world, which is that we're overly dependent on a handful of of things. But that can change. <laughs> um, and there's a whole bunch of regenerative stories about why when it changes, actually, every, things get better. For, for the farmer, for the, for the economy, for everyone. So, um, okay. The question was from that diversity, can you get an emergent, you know, set of properties from a, from a, for a leather like material that actually is going to have the strength, the elongation, the, uh, okay. But that's where we can pull in now engineering principles, right? So we, and, and we can just note too, um, it may be another thing I should have quickly added was we take it for granted how amazing what, what kind of amazing engineering is in a tree for example like when you see a tree and it's huge cantilevered beams are out there swaying in the wind and the kind you understand the kind of forces on on like you can't make synthetic systems <laughs> that do that, let alone that they're alive and they replicate themselves and whatever. Okay. So, um, nature also has this performance. It's just like, but I don't want to like put a, a stump on my foot and pretend that's a shoe. I know, you know, my, my last name is Haverhals. So that's a Dutch name and it, there's a Dutch tradition around making shoes out of wood. Um, they're not very comfortable generally speaking, it, but the, people put on lots of socks for padding for those kinds of, okay. So, we, we want to have things that are a little more comfortable than that. So, okay, how do you work with the natural material to get, you know, when, when we say price to performance ratio, it, it really is that. Like every single product, every single material that make that goes into making these products, they have an impact, they have a cost, both economically and on people and the planet and animals and all that. So they all have a cost. And then it's like, what's the performance envelope that it needs to do? You need to think about that holistically, like like I know Bellroy does with making products, which is like, okay, if you can have a high performing thing that might have a little bit of extra cost, if if you're going, you know, you something that has like, um, fit, you know, let's say twenty percent more impact is worth it if it has two hundred percent more durability and and you're going to be able to use it, like, like that ratio works. So yeah, price to performance ratios. Um, don't just apply to how we think about materials, but it's like when we get deep in the weeds with with companies like Bellroy on like its price to performance ratio of the product and how those things can all come together. And then um, if you can balance those equations out, then, then that gets you working towards regenerative. Maybe one other thing I'll say, and it's kind of a leading thing to the next part of the discussion perhaps, but one of the things you have to recognize too is when you say price to performance ratio, there's something um, in the, uh, I don't know what I say, there's something intrinsic about the cost. I'll say today, one of the things that humans are recognizing in, in 2021 that maybe you'd say back in 2000 or back in 1970 or back in 1950 that we didn't really do as well, which is um, recognize the true cost of things. So today there's a lot of things that um, don't cost as much from a price perspective, right? You can go to the store, you can buy that thing and it costs $5 and the other widget that's more, you, you, you think more or less does the same thing for you costs $10. Well, why should I ever buy the $10 thing instead of the $5 thing? Well, the truth is something that might be $5 where we haven't recognized the methane emissions associated with fracking and petrochemical extraction, or we haven't recognized the, the cost of microfiber, uh, microfiber and nanofiber pollution 
uh, in r- rivers and oceans. Um, and where I'll just say, w- maybe our generation won't pay as much of that cost because na- nature will recycle me <laughs> before I, but, but okay, if I care about my kids, if I care about my kids' kids, if I'm just generally speaking, um, being a good steward, then I, I should think carefully about what is the full in, holistic, all in cost of something. And sometimes those things are not, or I'll just say, generally speaking, um, especially within the, I'll just pick on the United States right now. There's a lot of, and I'm, I'm, and I'm one of them, so I'm a hypocrite when I say this. But when I walk into a store, I don't pay the true cost of, of many of the things that I buy. And that, that's a real problem because when you don't, then that price to performance ratio is actually a false thing. We're actually, in, in a way, we're subsidizing the non-regenerative, non-thing by having the, the wrong measurement system about what is the, what is the true cost. Those externalities that, um, you know, when we consume a fossil fuel, there's carbon emissions, there are other gases that go out and degrade things that haven't, Previously, it was very hard to measure those because the technology wasn't there. And so it was hard to price them. So we now have the technology to measure. We now need to start building some form of pricing mechanisms for, for sort of soaking up the pollution, these, these negative externalities. But there's then also this thing that like there's, there mm-hmm. must have been trillions of dollars put into the petrochemical industry I mean, all that infrastructure you spoke about from the hundreds of trillions. Hundreds of trillions when you think about when you, when you think about like the last hundred years of human economy. And that's one of the things people don't understand is like even if let, let's imagine that I could snap my fingers and I could make a machine that magically pulls carbon dioxide out of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you know, sinks it in some geological formation and it was, it cost nothing to do it. Even if I could do that, then if I want to deliver enough product now though, to bring the other, you know, there's, there's two and a half or something billion people that live in this, um, you know, live on enough money per year that we can have closets full of shoes and a car in the driveway and all this other stuff. Okay, but there's like 5 billion people on planet Earth that would love, love, love to live like the rest of us. And yet, when you think about how many trillions of dollars of infrastructure it takes to now go get, go get you know, a fossil carbon out of the ground twice as fast to service twice as many customers, you can't do it. There's not enough money. It, like, it, it doesn't work, um, let alone, okay, so... Even when you have this magical, perfect solution like carbon sequestration, it still requires other kinds of interventions in order to be holistically good. So that's that's why we got to like, that's where we need to tap into nature because nature's already it's, figured it's, this stuff out. It's like, so good though. It's so good. And anyway. and it, it's so important that it it's not just sort of a pipe dream of wouldn't it be wonderful. It's that we have to really understand these economic incentives and drivers and we really have to understand what sorts of changes have a real chance of reaching impact and scale, yeah. have a real chance of coming. And so, yeah, if, if we're trying to replicate hundreds of trillions of dollars in a short term yeah. to get a new material up and running, it, it's just not going to happen. And so, as you said, what can we tap into that's already there? We've just got to find a new way to bring it wow. into an economy, bring it into processes and conversions and, and sort of tap it in a way that, we know we're drawing on things that are abundant, not things that are scarce, things that don't have as many negative externalities because they're already interwoven in ecosystems. Um, it, it, it's such a rich, rich area. Um, I wanted to spin now to a little bit sort of product geek, innovation geek area. Um, so you, you have so much potential. It's starting. Like, yeah. It's a, it must be a very hard journey when you're not trying to create just one little slither. You're trying to create platforms that are interconnected, that, that take different aspects in and deliver in multiple ways. Like, how hard is that to build a business to try and bring this innovation to market? So sometimes I'll, I'll in certain contexts, I'll, I'll tell people that I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I don't know, like... 
because because of my upbringing, where I'm from, I'll say I saw entrepreneur. Anyone who grows up on a farm um, sees, you know, the, the, a family farm is really an entrepreneurial sort of exercise. But so you could say my roots are all, we're already in entrepreneurism. But um, I was very ignorant. <laughs> a little, and, well, I continue to be ignorant about any number of things. But um, to start a company like this, you have to have a healthy dose of optimism and and a good amount of ignorance to go with it. Um, so you don't realize, uh, how hard it's going to be. Uh, that being said, you know, one, one of the things is any good idea, if you can bring the right people around it, if, if you're willing to collaborate and, and, and share, um, and let other people with other skill sets and points of view, bring in the value that they can bring in, then, then good ideas can Anyway, they can happen and they can flourish. And, and we live in an amazing time in history where, you know, someone on a completely different continent than me on the other, like literally in the other side of the world for me, um, we can collaborate and share ideas and, and, and you can bring your um, deep, deep ex- expertise into how Bellroy can make things that go into the world with you and they work and they, and they, and they last and they have the kind of value that you want to keep around you and on your person all the time. And I can focus on making a couple of materials that might help you do what you do with a, a slightly improved or maybe a, a, a really big improved price to performance ratio, so to speak. So, um, you know, w- one of the things that I discovered really, really early in, in this was, well, I was very fortunate. I met a gentleman, his name is Steve Zika. And um, Steve's father's name is Ken Zika, and, and they have an investment fund, a family, small family fund called Atolo. And uh, Atolo in Latin means to lift up. Um, and what they were doing with, with the resources that they are stewards of is trying to lift other people up. And they, they lifted me up. So, and they lifted NFW up. And so, you know, when, when you meet people like that and when, when we meet people... <laughs> like you, um, and you put uh, these kinds of people around an idea like this, then anyway, th- that I, what I like, uh, what lets me sleep well at night, I, I'll say not my inbox, not a whole bunch of things to do. When I sleep well, um, it's because, you know, first and foremost, I have a family that loves me, a wife and kids that love me. I've got people like Steve and, and Ken Zika, um, and, and people like you on other continents that um, are all doing different parts that I could never do by myself. But when you put the diversity of skill sets around it, a good idea wins. It just wins. So that, that's a really, that's really fun. It, I mean, we'll get to uh, talk about products and show products and sell products here. Very, right. We're working on these things very, and they're coming out very soon. And then I'll say, and the first generation will be the first gen. And then there's already improvements that we have in the works about making those things perform even better in the next generation. And it's like that we can geek out a long time on, on all the different things we can do, not only from a performance perspective, but now we can start thinking about, you know, what's Bellroy's supply chain look like? Like NFW isn't going to be just in, in pure Illinois very quickly. We're, we're in different parts of North America, yes, but then we're on other continents here um, very soon. So um, how do we optimize that um, in order to bring in um, stakeholders that all have a vested interest in seeing seeing this thing flourish? So anyway, I'll say I'm, I'm really grateful um, to, to, to a whole bunch of people uh, that have lifted me up and lifted up natural fiber welding. To, to make it possible because such it, lovely words for understanding the ecosystems around and and the way you know when uh, we describe it in Bellroy as when smart people with good intentions who can get shit done come together it's like all right stuff's stuff can happen mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, it's, that's a, it's so that's a much more pithy way to put it than I did. Yeah, like, totally agree. I, I can see um, those supply chains, those existing processes you spoke about. Like at the moment, say Miram 
is being um, worked on in essentially roll form. So it'll come out in sheets and, and, and then rolls longer sheets where, you know, cut and sew is done to it. We reformulate it. But as you were mm-hmm. holding up those foamed insoles before, as, as you start to talk about the soles of shoes, there's also ways that these ingredients, like when you take this, I'll, I'll call it raw mirim, but it's it's the wrong term. I'm sure you've got like uh, perhaps um, non-cross-linked mirim or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Or you take like vegetable oil and natural rubber and mixtures dough, thereof, for example. Back to the yeah. cooking analogies. Um, and so you get to... You get a dough. You, you know, That's you right. You get push dough. that through rollers yep. and, and sort of... Um, yep. cross-link it into flat sheet, but you could also compression mold it and you can also shape and form in in different thicknesses. You could also create harder That's and right. softer zones. You can hybridize it with the Claris weaves and start to have coatings. That's right. So, yeah, just the potential. So describe That's what right. that is. Yeah. So, um, well, I'm just holding up some demos while you talk about it. But th- this this is actually blue jeans. Nothing and, but, but blue jeans. Not watching There's video. no blue. This is like patches um, of and, jean. Uh, you can you can anyway, see strong the, kind of plywood the kind of quality. You can see the pocket details. You can see different colors. Yeah. There's literally what you're seeing. What you're seeing here is. You're, you're, that's right. We just we literally. We, we literally cut up the blue jeans into little little pieces and and then on one side we used a big a larger piece of scrap denim to have like so to show that you could have anyway you can have if you like this aesthetic then here it is and if you like a cleaner aesthetic then here it is and in the middle is a whole bunch of other chopped up blue jeans and um and i'll say so yeah for literally when, when you think about the ecosystem of technical uh, nutrient Fine. plastics around. You've got hard, soft, you know, thermoplastics, thermal sets, but, but, but you've got things that can be molded and compre- you know, this is compression molded. So this is all natural compression molded. And, um, this is a slightly different kind of compression molding. Cause well, I could, if I could hold it up close enough, you'll see it has, there's a, anyway, there's a leather like texture on it. Right. So, um, but then when you when you get to the whole thing now, what you can think about is, well, how do we design this so that it feels great? But how do we also design it where you can rip this part off from this part? Now you can make, this is ingredient for dough. This is ingredient for dough. These are doughs we can make again. So what, one of the um, one of the things in, in the patent sort of families is, is some really, really powerful um, say chemistry and manufacturing sort of like amalgam ideas where you can grind things up in particular ways and get remoldable, reshapable dough. Um, and then I'll say, and, and sometimes um, it's, it's actually even better just to grind it up and give it back to nature. Cause na- you know, nature at certain levels of scale of things does it better than we could do it. But, when you have supply chain and the material's already there and it's already in the factory anyway, and you've you've got cutting scrap and you can just put it back into a system that makes it dough again. Now there's less dough to make for the next batch. You, you literally, um, here's a really interesting uh, stat. So there, there are people who make, you know, automotive interiors. Um, and if people, pe- most people don't recognize, but for every square foot that ends up in a car of, of, a, of a leather, there's something like two square feet that are wasted that end up in a landfill. So, um, you know, we worry about where, where do cars go at the end of the life and does the car leather end up in a landfill? Well, guess what? Making the car had a tremendous amount of waste before you ever put what ends up, you know, you buy a new car and eventually it's an old car and it's ended for, there's, there's all kinds of waste that people don't recognize that goes into making things even just the first time. And when you can solve those problems, those deep embedded problems uh, with something where you, you have unit economics that, that drive that solution, then, well, I'll just say for, for better or for worse, um, businesses make money <laughs> um, and and the, the goal is, though, how do you make the money in a responsible way 
that where you've got the right incentives to drive, um, you know, regenerative practice, not just not just sustainable, not just circular. Uh, we really need what I would call regenerative is really the combination of like systems that self heal. Uh, and that's, that's not only true philosophically, it's true of these materials. They can be sort of self healed once you've ground them it, up and you've so torn them lovely. all apart, you can put them right back together again and they heal you know, back some up. Some of us uh, who think through the sustainability space have, have trouble with the word sustainability because it's like, we don't really want to sustain what we have right now as well. And it's like, instead, what about... Yeah, I know. It's, where, it means everything every and nothing cycle, at the same time. Every time around, it can still be updated with modern context. It can still be given a new form that still resonates and that has relevance in the world as it is right now. And, and, and we're not trying to sustain something that has other issues. And Anyway, it's all semantics, okay. but it, it, it's it's a fascinating part. The other thing I've been intrigued by is just the caliber of partners that you're working with. I mean, you have some of the best car companies in the world, some of the best footwear companies in the world. Can, can you talk about that ecosystem of partners and and the sorts of things that all of us can help you with, um, help NFW with? Like for Bellroy, the reason we have conversations like this and try and share is because we want this technology to be adopted. There's, there's still things you're teasing out, parts that are being tested, but the potential so much, we, we want the world embracing these things much sooner. But mm -hmm. what can brands like Bellroy and, and the incredible partners you're working with, what can we do to help make this stuff um, get a sale that would have otherwise gone to a you know, hydrocarbon-based thing that has toxins yeah. and will pollute the supply chain as it sort of moves through it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's one thing that we do. And then there's one thing that, that folks like you do that I think like sums it up well, which is say, you know, we have this very fast iterate iterative cycle within our company. And, and because the technology fundamentally scales, it means fundamentally we can like do different versions of it without spending a lot of money. <laughs> um, and you know, one of our, um, key kind of ways in which we we think about things is is we we don't go after solutions that are going to um anyway not scale at the end of the day um so you know unit economics and 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 what problem are we solving are like high in our mind and then i'll say what the partners bring is deep deep knowledge about what the product needs to do and how the pro where the product comes from and where it will go to and left to our own devices, natural fiber welding can't possibly know everything it needs to know about where shoes come from and where shoes go to and where cars come from and cars go to and where furniture comes from and furniture goes to and bags come from. We can't possibly. But um, because we have this fast clock and a really scalable technology and because, of course, it really helps, too, that we can talk about price points that don't that won't wreck your day. Um, what we get is, is this wonderful conversation where companies like Bellroy teach natural fiber welding exactly what we need to do to earn your business. And then if we can do it, well, then we do business. <laughs> um, it, it's like, it, it's, and, 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 and some levels it's like really simple that way. In other ways, it's, I guess it's really, you know, genius and amazing, but, but, but that's the simple truth. When people come around and say, okay, this is, this is what the material we're using today does. And here's what's undesirable in our system about that. And here's, here's what we would like to do. And, and NFW, can you, you know, let's talk about the things you can do. And then, and then we have very specific conversations about how we're going to measure. One, one of the things I think that's worth noting, um, you know, and, the, it like, and it ties back to what you said earlier about sustainability. There are a lot of people in the world who, who they say the word sustainability, but it's not tied to any real measure. That's where you get this greenwashing business going on is people don't tie, they either hide information or they, they, they're, the information they have is so at the surface and not tied to any real measurement of a significant problem that you end up, it doesn't mean anything. So that deep, deep knowledge about okay, what's the problem we're going to, or problems we're going to solve? What do those problems cost holistically? And, and NFW, 
can you help us? <laughs> like that's that's like been the genesis of of all of these partnerships, quite frankly. And then why do they go so well? Well, we're fortunate in that nature already solved a bunch of problems we didn't have to solve. And um, with the right approach to, to working with the technology, then you can solve lots of kinds of problems. And when you start, when you do it through time, right? That's the other thing. We've been working together for a while. We, on day one, we didn't have something perfect for you. Um, and we've learned a lot because you taught us where we fall. You know, we go back two years in time and say, we didn't have this conversation yet because I was still, NFW is still falling on its face. But okay, through time, you build trust, you build common context and knowledge, you measure the right things together, you solve the right problems. That's the blocking and the tackling that uh, that wins the wins the day. So good. Um, is there anything we should have talked about that I haven't? I'm I'm aware. Like I would have loved um, to talk more about how consumers navigate the space or what they do. It, I I have one more thing, and it ties back though to this to this question again. What what can what can companies do to help NFW? Let's just say there's a lot of ideas about what people should do about. X, Y, or Z. And being holistic and being transparent in the problem to be solved is like everything. Because I'll just say, we, we have this situation right now where um, there are people, they're very well-intentioned. They, 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 they want to, to make the world a better place. And in some cases, what they're doing within a, within a very narrow niche can make the world a better place. And yet, Often though, what what gets you know on on runways and museums and then gets attracts hundreds of millions of investor dollars and is is stuff that doesn't have any teeth and you can know it at the start because you can say you can get really serious at the start about what are we measuring and and what do the what are the basic laws of chemistry and thermodynamics and engineering you know principles and things. What do those things say about where this thing can go? Now we can we can note that um, for a long time in human history, people looked up at the moon and said, "I don't know how to jump that high. I don't know how to get there." Okay, and it took significant investment to get there. Something, something, and, and, you know, before you land on the moon, you spend lots of money <laughs> to, to before you put one foot on the moon. So, okay, there, there's technologies some. There's technologies out there that cost a lot, even before you 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 know proverbially see the the fruit of it. On the other hand, there were rigorous scientific principles that made a moon landing knowable and possible to to go try to do that and, and put those kinds of resources there. Right now, I see a lot of large companies who are continuing to measure things in ways that I'll just say they skew to favor the petrochemical refinery production system. And you see it in how people are reporting their carbon numbers. Um, and you see it in the ways that in which people are not integrating the latest scientific data. Like for example, 10 years ago, we didn't have a bunch of satellites and drones flying around showing where the methane emissions are really coming from on planet Earth. And it, I'll just say the, the amount of cows out there has been pretty flat for the last 10, 20 years. The amount of methane in the atmosphere is not. Okay, and modern agriculture, as we already noted, nowhere close to perfect, all kinds of improvements required. And yet you can measure those systems in ways that make it more transparent to what's going wrong than what we're measuring on the petrochemical side of things right now. And it's a real shame that we're not integrating the latest data, I'll say, there's a number of people who run brands who the kinds of measurement systems, and if you can read my LinkedIn, I, I won't share names right now, right? This will keep it on the on the up and up here, but I'll say you can read my LinkedIn and find where I'll, I'll just say it like it is. Like there's people out there that either the measurement system they're using is in, is willfully not reflective of reality and or where they're unable or unwilling to update it to reflect reality. And when you when you when you have systems like that, then what what are the young up and coming chemists 
and, and engineers and consumers, we're all consumers. What do we, what do we think? Well, we, we only know what we're, what we're sort of taught at some level to, to measure and think it has value. And when we don't measure some of these things, well, like, again, I, this is true of materials. It's true of relationships with each other. It, it, it all comes down to what do you value? And if you value it, then measure it the right way. Put the time in to, to do it and, and then make the time to, to report it the right way. It's like so, so important. Um, in the end, NFW should sink or swim sort of on its own merit and, and the kinds of problems that it solves. And if someone comes along with a with a better way to do it, well, uh, like I certainly haven't thought. I, I think what we're doing is is the right approach, and so I pour a whole bunch of my life and sweat and blood and tears into it. But um, there's other people with great ideas. Let's just make sure we're measuring the right thing so that we're all on equal footing, so that over time the resources go to the things that actually solve the right problems. I, I love that so much. And one of the things, like every human has blind spots. You know, we all have lenses yep. we see the world through. And that one of the jobs of collaboration and the diversity you spoke before, just as we want diversity in our ecosystems, we want diversity of thought. And that's to okay. help unearth and recognize some of those blind spots. There's not one good and one bad. The, it, the world's not polarized into black and white and no gray in between. And so when we measure, we don't want to measure only one thing. Like that horrible polluting meme of, you know, business's sole purpose is to maximize shareholder value. It's like, I, I don't know of any human that has only one goal in life. You know, earlier you spoke of family, okay. friends, right. collaboration, colleague, impact, all these things. Why would a business only have one goal in, exactly. in, in its exactly. life? And so we need measurement and then we need to continually be open to things that we haven't measured. We need to continually realize, oh, there's these little biomes of life with all these micro life organisms that help digest our food for us. It's not just mechanical systems in the body. We weren't even measuring those before. We weren't even aware of them and the role they play. And so this notion of measurement and continually opening up to things we might be blind to measuring and through collaboration starting to realize, oh, shit, you've actually got to measure carbon emissions. And methane emissions and all these other carbon equivalents. But then what are these other things we're failing to measure? And then once we take it, how can we weave that knowledge and those systems and that, those feedback loops into things that we can sort of leverage up and get more yep. scale around? Again, you said it really, really well. It's like, you know, we have, here's a, here's a really great exi- uh, example, I think, of, of like what you just said, but like, okay, here, here's some facts about it. We have a measurement called eutrophication. All right, and it's measured in equivalence of um, phosphate, which is a, a nutrient, which you, know, you get too much of this in into the Gulf of Mexico, you get algae blooms. And, and I'll say, and it's a real issue that has to do with farming, right? And, and, and I'll also note that farmers, generally speaking, don't wanna pay for fertilizer that they're not gonna get a benefit from and use. So, we got GPS now and a whole bunch of things where things are unbelievably better um, now than they were even like five, 10 years ago because some of the technology is coming online. Okay. And it needs to continue. What we don't have though, and, and, and I'll say when you, when you measure things, then therefore like um, you're going to compare leather or uh, wool or some natural material that comes from agriculture. You're going to compare that to the synthetic. Okay. Well, eutrophication is very strongly um, about a new over nutrienting uh, a water system such that you get undesirable characteristics. Okay, but you know what we don't have is the counterpart to that that measures the petrochemical fair system fairly, which I would call putrefication, <laughs> which is which is that when an oil rig blows up or or a pipeline in in off the coast of California gets hit by a boat anchor or something or um, microfiber, you know, plastic pollution in the wearing and the washing of our clothes or, you know, that, that these things, and I say it's very difficult because the science in some cases is, is not like firmly all, like we don't know exactly what the true cost is. That being said, we know that it is happening and that there are effects. And all of the early data says these things are not neutral. They're not good. They're certainly not good. They're certainly not neutral. 
And how bad they are, well, it depends on, again, how much you want to index in, in certain. But we have systems of measurement that that right now say, well, there's a eutrophication number that you can run your life cycle analysis for. And then these same systems, they, there's no putrefication, so to speak, uh, number that can be run. And, and, and then, you know, there's, there's no number right now when, when, you, when you go say, I'm going to use a standard amount of methane to make a standard amount of some material. Today, there's no updating of the system for the fact that, you know, if, if you're the, the best guesstimates right now are that for every hundred units of methane that comes from the Permian Basin, there's three or four units of methane that got vented dr direct to atmosphere during the fracking and the, the and the you know during the drilling and the and the transport and all of the other things. I'm sorry, but if you don't like, have that in, and everyone's running their LCAs right now without thinking about that, like you can't put your head in the sand about this stuff and pretend it's not there. And I don't know everything, and and there's other people that know certain things better than me. So it's really important we have these these healthy conversations and dialogues and live in the, in the strain. And in some cases we just, we have, we don't know. So we have to estimate. One of the things I've, I've always just cherish about the time we get in these conversations is it's essentially a story of optimism. It's essentially like open up to the fact that when we adopt a new technology, there must be benefits, but there will always be negatives be as well. That be every new technology comes with downsides as well. And it's that, it, it's stop the willful blindness, like actually get their head out of the sand and like acknowledge that. And then can we steer towards the technologies? Like we're not going to solve this by removing technology. It, it's not the right approach. Technologies serve us in many great ways that as we discussed earlier, they have brought so many billions of humans out of extreme poverty. They've extended life. Yep. They've done so many great things. It's just there are choices in technologies. There are better technologies that come with many fewer negative externalities, many fewer downsides. And so can we start to choose those technologies that not only have fewer downsides immediately, but actually are leading us towards greener pastures, are leading us towards better practices, are drawing on abundant systems rather than scarce systems, are doing these things. And that was why... You know, we're, we're Bellroy's a brand that started with leather. Um, we've done so much we can, like everything we can to try and make mm -hmm. leather better. We've worked on animal welfare. We've worked on um, effluent sustainability. We've, we've done so many things. But we're not wedded to leather. Like the reason we haven't used synthetic leathers previously is because they come with this whole other bundle of problems. They're That's petrochemically right. derived. They have all sorts of toxins. There's a lot of other synthetic leathers that, feel like they should be a good thing. They use a little bit of this plant or that cactus or this thing. But when you actually look into it, the backbone of it is still petrochemical. It's still mm -hmm. a number of things that are toxic to humans when ingested that can rub off. And so we haven't wanted to begin on a new platform that's not leading somewhere great. I think the thing I take out of this as, as we sort of get close to a close is it is an optimistic story if we choose the right technologies to start on and then we strive and we work really hard to make those outperform the current things how can we get That's right. a plant-based leather to perform better than a grown leather how how can we have the properties more diverse more custom and specific and fit for purpose how can we actually like build better performance that is still at a great price and end of life you've got options do you want to recycle it do you want to compost it how like how do you want to deal with it so it is a, I, I think for me it is a story of optimism it is that if we if we're demanding if we're open to the real consequences if we're measuring the right things there are genuinely better technologies here and that's what we need to get on board with do i need to say anything else <laughs> anyway i'll just say thank you i mean with, with optimism it is gratitude despite all the things that are wrong, there's so many things to be grateful and optimistic about. The other thing is, because everything has an impact, we'll never be done. Hopefully we'll leave, we'll leave every, you know, things in a better state than we found it. Um, I have a really dear uh, friend, rest his soul from the Naval Academy named uh, Matt Foley. 
And Matt Foley used to sing this song in the lab called Cleaner Than We Found It. <laughs> um, and it's like, I don't know, there's deep, deep wisdom um, in those that little simple phrase. I love it. Um, Luke, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think... You know, we'll have to work out a follow-up. Uh, we, as, as you hinted at earlier, we are working on more product together. We, we integrated a little bit of Miram in some early pouches. Um, mm -hmm. We've been trying to realistically sort of add things at the point where the technology is ready for without compromising products being used and loved for as long as possible. We're, we're getting very close to the next iteration. And as you said, the, the next and the next and the one after are the ones where I think we're all just going to get more and more excited. Um, thank you so much for just caring and informing and striving and all the work everyone at NFW does and the incredible team you've brought together. Um, thank you for your time. And I, I really look forward to seeing the platform you're creating just grow in impact and meaning. Thank you. Thanks for helping us uh, make it possible. Wonderful. Thank you.